When they ask if anybody objects, he instructed you to object your own mother's marriage. Yes. If you're not doing your own work, you have no fucking right to go help somebody else. This episode isn't a perfect blueprint for you to fix your fucking life. This is the problem is people don't fucking listen. Don't fuck with me. By the way, I am a licensed therapist and I do have the right to say f your family in therapy, Jasper. Hell no. Worst day of my life, what was the answer? Hmm. Alcohol, that fixed it. I have that dark, crazy side and that's where the profile picture comes from. One time I had the knife. I didn't kill her, but I could have. Folks, I'm here to remind you about the best fantasy sports app, Better. Y'all could download today $500 first deposit match. So if you go on the app, we're matching deposits up to $500. This is the best fantasy sports app. You could win up to 200 times your money. And with multiplied boosters up to 300 times your money, a bunch of people are winning. Someone just turned $60 into 11000 the other day. This is better picks download better and start playing today so they were actually but why but why were they roasting him though that's what i wanted to know like didn't you get flamed up for one of the episodes um so no just sometimes like well back in the day now i have a healthier practice and i'm more involved mentally uh i used to just show up brain fried like when we were in new york after the rich paul episode i don't know if this one's coming out before or after um i just had left an underground bunker where everyone was on drugs and drunk. I was just drunk as fuck till like six in the morning. And then we had to film. So like, I won't be, you know, all the way there. And maybe that episode, I wasn't all the way there. And they just were like, get this guy the fuck out of here. But I'm here to stay. I think. <laughs> You're here to stay, man. Not going anywhere. Okay, good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too comfortable. <laughs> That's true. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> so that's why we. That's why Susie's here. Yeah, today. that's why I'm here. You know, I do a lot of grief counseling. And, <laughs> I'm you know, losing transition my Transition and you know shit like that. So yeah, so I I wanted to fire you on air, and have Susie here to like kind of console this situation yeah. that's yeah. about to go down. Yeah, and to help you out. And so. You know, white this tears. is a little fucking twisted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So welcome back to BS. Um, we are here for another amazing week, another amazing episode. Jasper is back and we are joined um, by the none other than Susie Landolfi. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's disgusting. It's so, so happy, happy to be here. It's, it's disgusting. disgusting. Um, Susie, I'll, I'll give you I'll give Susie the proper intro. So. Okay. Susie is one of my favorite people in the world, and I don't say that often. She's one of those people that loves life with such positivity and unmatched energy that brightens up any room she walks into. Susie can box, dance, act, is an entrepreneur. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I started working with Susie as a therapist, and she's become an amazing teacher friend. And we've kind of been on a little mission together to just help as many people as we can. Um, around us because your work has helped me and I wanted to film this episode because I know everyone struggles with something um, in their life everyone has their own struggles and understanding why your emotions and trauma and why you act the way you act is such a game-changing superpower and that's what our work together has sort of helped me with and it's changed my life immensely it took a lot of work and practice and learning but it's been so helpful so I've always wanted to share Susie's message and like some of our work and practice and I still have bigger ideas of like how we could do that on a massive scale but I thought what better place to start than a conversation with my therapist Ooh. on BS <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you, you almost made the therapist cry no you actually did that's a good Aww. thing <laughs> that's a good thing you know it's a two-way street so one of the most wonderful things that I get to do is decide who I'm going to work with and when they ask me, and then when you and I met and we kind of tiptoed around to see if we were a good fit, when I really met you, when I really saw who you really are and the dedication that you have to your change, I was all in, Jake. And that's no BS. 
Like you were fucking, oh, by the way, I am a licensed therapist and I do have the right to say fuck. That's yes. A, it's a clinical term <laughs> if anybody's worried about it, okay? Okay. So, <laughs> you were so fucking in on your, like everything that you do. So for me, if someone doesn't want to do the work, then I get to say, you know what? I don't think so. I don't think we're a good fit. So I wanted to tell you that, that you're in all the time. And there's two kinds of people in the world, people who want to know. They just want to know. They want to know everything. You're one of those people. You're one of those people, Jasper. And then there's a whole bunch of people that don't want to know. They already think they know. They're like, no, I already got this. I know this. I don't want to know. And I, I'm too old. I don't know how much time I got left to be able to hang out with people like that. Yeah, I think that's a big part of the problem is when people, like you said, think that they know everything. Because... I think they maybe realize that it's scarier to unfold the truths, to look at the truths in the face, to look at their flaws, to look yeah. at their mishaps. And a lot of times with this work, you know, that we did, and even my spiritual work of like psychedelics, ayahuasca, toad, all of those things. And then working with you, it's like taking a lot of steps backwards. Oh, yeah. Before you take steps forwards you got to own your shit and to own it you got to look at it and if you don't want to look at it how are you going to own it how are you going to be able to move forward i oftentimes say to the combat veterans if i gave you a rucksack and you're going out on a mission a life threatening mission and i already filled the rucksack with a whole bunch of shit that doesn't work that won't help you on the mission and it's all old shit or shit from other people what would you do when i turn my back and they go oh, dump that shit out and I go, well, that's what we're going to do is we're going to go back and take everything out and take a look at it. Some of the things that happened to you as a kid actually help make you who you are today. They are superpowers. And some of that shit is going to bring you down. I mean, literally. Yeah. And so I think <clears throat> I think that's maybe where we can start off. I think your specialty is going back into childhood trauma mm -hmm. or one of your many specialties is going back into the childhood trauma because i think what people don't realize is that everything is like learned behavior and what you do and the habits you create and the reason you act the way you act is from your childhood and those default settings <clears throat> seeing what your parents did seeing what how your parents acted and that's subconsciously what is developing in your brain as you grow older and then you go back to those defaults and when you sort of start to unlock these keys to see your these specific life events that have happened the big ones the, the even the little ones the things that how your parents treated you every day your relationship with your parents your relationship with your teachers your friends all of these things as a kid are what have the biggest effect on you when you grow up and when i started unlocking these keys and these answers i was able to see how I was acting and reacting to certain things, comments in relationships with my friends, even still dealing with my parents, even dealing with my brother and how to be centered more in these situations. Um, and I think it could be good maybe for the viewers because that's kind of maybe a lot to unpack if people yeah. like aren't understanding what's going on. And it's crazy how in today's society there's such a lack of emotional intelligence Ugh. it's like insane and i don't know how humans and this is why i think people are depressed anxious fearful ang angry and we're dealing with so many mental health issues because there's so many new stimulants and social media and all these things in the world but we're forgetting and lacking emotional intelligence to be able to deal with all of these things. Yeah, it's the training. So every day you train, almost every day you train. And you know as a boxer and um, that how you train is very important. And sometimes you learn some training you had to unlearn. Is that correct? Yeah. Like each time, even when your body changed, you and I talked about this yesterday, is, is that, oh, wait, I can't do it that way anymore. This is more effective if I do it that way. Yet we never do that with our training as children. And, and Jasper, you told me a wonderful story about this guy in your neighborhood. So here's your family struggling, your own family struggling, a place that's supposed to be safe, and yet it wasn't as safe as this guy down the street, this white guy actually down the street. And so if you don't look at that and you don't understand what happened to you, how it affected you, 
and what you get to do about it. And remember, there's two things that you got from it. You got trauma, you got the anxiety, the depression, you got ways of being and thinking that are not even yours. Most of what you think about yourself or feel about yourself was either done to you or told to you. That's just a fact. So I don't trust everything I think about me or feel about me. And you also got superpowers. Like that trauma also gave you post-traumatic wisdom, yep. post-traumatic growth. And to not know yeah. that, that's setting people up for failure, a lot of failure. Yeah, and I th I think that's you know, you're you're thrown into this world, um, not knowing these things, and it's often not a conversation. I think even when I and I see, I'm gonna call these guys out. I oh, see good. it with all of these guys too. Like when I start to talk about these things, a lot of people like reject it. They're like, "Oh, yeah, like <laughs> it will happen to you as well, a like kid." A, a common practice, and I'm like, like <laughs> and I'm like, "No, dog." <laughs> that's right. Like. <laughs> Listen, brother, that's your ego. That's right. That's your ego. That's right. And, and it's like coming to save you to have you think a certain way um, and to protect yourself from maybe like unraveling. That's right. All of those things and all of those voids that happen and are created um, that people start to fill with all of these lies or drugs or alcohol. That's right. Um, or women or men or whatever it might be. Right. And I think maybe to give us, I think it'd be good for the viewers, like to kind of give a specific example of like the, some of the work we do. Right. So I guess we'll, we, we would just get on the phone. We start talking. Right. Mm -hmm. And just unraveling things. How'd you guys meet in the first place? How did your relationship start? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> we met through, I guess, the people at Unbreakable. Mm -hmm. um, so Jay Glazer and, and D-Cut obviously took me to Unbreakable. And Susie was working um, at Unbreakable with the MVP program, which different than my MVP. Right. Hers is merging vets and players. Mm -hmm. And so she would do sessions there. And then that's kind of the circle of how we met. Um, but I knew there was just like stuff going on. I was like, just like on this journey to better myself. And I was like, I don't know this, like there's just stuff that needs to be worked on. Um, so yeah, we, we start talking. Right. And it's just like opening Pandora's box. And I think just like a specific example that I'll use and it's it, it's being vulnerable. I think being vulnerable here is like the best thing. And that you, you, with a therapist and all these things, you also have to like open up and be vulnerable and trust them and such. But one of the things that I think was a really big key factor for me was my mom's wedding day when she was getting remarried um, to my stepdad there was like this whole big craziness around it. Yep. And my dad didn't want them to like have a good wedding and like wanted to kind of like sabotage the things and made me feel bad for like even attending and was like, whenever they say, if anyone objects to this wedding, like I, you have to stand up and, and be like, I object and, Jeez. and go against it Not and so, so like i'm going to this wedding and wait so let me get straight so so your 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 father your mother was getting remarried married your father said when you're when they when they ask if anybody objects he instructed you to object your own mother's marriage yes and you're how old i was seven 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 and Bro, so what the fuck and he was like yeah i'm gonna be like super maybe i was eight but i I'm going to be super disappointed if you don't do this, da, da, da. And to me, like, I had kind of buried this moment and kind of like forgot about it, whatever, like moved on or whatever. So this was like the worst day of my life going to this wedding, right? Mm -hmm. And it should be amazing. Like, I should be celebrating my mom doing this. But like, I'm just like, nah, like, screw this. Because my dad indoctrinated me to like hate this man that, I shouldn't have hated for any reason and mm -hmm. to to 
object to this wedding. The, otherwise, he's going to be disappointed in me. And I feel like I'm going to let him down if I'm even at this wedding. Um, So this is like the worst day of my life, right? And my mom's kind of just like fed up with it because it's her fucking wedding day. So she, lo and behold, <laughs> gives me like a whole like glass of beer and is like, just drink this. So I'm seven, eight years old. Mm. Drink. And she's like, yo, take this. Boom. And all of a sudden, I'm drunk as fuck, having the best time of my life. I forget about all the things my dads are saying. Like, I'm not worried. All the stress goes away. All of a sudden, I'm on the dance floor doing headstands. And <laughs> I'm like, she gave it to you because she saw that you were anxious. Well, because was, I was crying. I was yeah. like, I was like, was I was terrified. ruining the energy yeah, of the whole terrified. wedding. I was ruining the energy of the whole wedding. Like, even if I'll, I'll put a picture on the screen, like you could just tell in this picture, like I'm just like crying and like pissed off. And my, it was like during the photos that I was like, supposed to take with my mom, with the professional photographer, and all this, <laughs> whatever. And this isn't to, I'm also not telling the story to like, for people to be like, oh, screw Greg and screw Pam and screw this mm -hmm. whole thing. And that's crazy. And what did they do? And I'm not trying to be like a victim either. I think that's a big thing with this work is a lot of people can fall victim to these things that they bring up and uncover and then like feel bad for themselves and then get like lost in that whole loophole. No, this is just to like understand and uncover. And it's no fault of their own because, by the way, my parents both mom and dad are highly traumatized people and grew up with crazy fucking parents as well. That's so right. they're just doing what they know. They're being controlling and manipulative because they were controlled and manipulated by their parents. And it's this never ending cycle until someone in the family <laughs> is like, let's end this shit. That's right. And let's figure this out. And this isn't normal for all of these things to happen. So, Worst day of my life, what was the answer? Hmm. Alcohol, that fixed it. So, so like neurologically in my young and developing brain and body bodily functions and all of these things, of course, later in life, when things start going wrong in my life and I'm having hard times, I'm going to naturally want to pick up alcohol to fix the problem and this was something that we uncovered yeah a lot amongst it, many other things but yeah and, and it wasn't you're absolutely right it wasn't to say anything against your mother and father i was not a perfect parent myself and the disruptor in the family that's what i call you the best disruptor there's always one in the family that wants to say wait it's got to stop it's got to stop with me you're that in your family you're that in your family i'm that in my family <clears throat> The problem is when there isn't that disruptor or the disruptor has to leave the family or there's revisionist history in a family where everybody goes, no, that didn't really happen. I oftentimes say to parents, if your child told you that something happened to them when they were kids and you did it, just say you're sorry. Don't argue with it because it's true. And the worst part of all of this is you are at risk of doing to yourself and others what was done to you. I mean, think about that. I have a question about that. Why is it that some people, there's like two routes. When 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 a kid is traumatized, he either passes on that trauma mm -hmm. or completely goes the opposite direction. Like, okay, if, for example, if somebody is physically abused, a lot of times people then go on to physically abuse their own kids. Right, not all but, of them. But also a lot of times people make a complete 180 and then not only don't abuse their kids, but tend to <clears throat> do work against that and like, you know, join groups to 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 help people that are physically abused. What what's the the shifting point for people? So, you know, they we'd, go? we'd love to know that, and we talk about resiliency in terms of where does that come from? Why are we all sitting here, us four, mm -hmm. wanting to know, right? And yet, my family's not here, so I would say that we're not quite sure. What we do know is, if you have one person in your life that will help you uncover that, if you have even one person that helps you get through those difficult times, mm. you are better apt to be able to find it later in life. That's your story, mm. right? That's your story, Jeff. Absolutely. That at least somebody was there. That's my story. Somebody was there uh, to do it. And I think ultimately it's whether or not you're going to take responsibility to create the person you deserve to be in the life you deserve to live. I had to do that too. 
I had to finally say, okay, a lot of shit happened to me. And I'm either going to continue to do, do that to myself and others, or I'm going to stop. It stops with me. Yeah. And then you do the hard work, like you said. And you do it until it becomes absolutely who you are at that moment. Yeah. I will say one other thing. I ran my life as you were, Jake, running our lives on our thoughts and feelings, right? And that determined our actions. So once I realized that my thoughts and feelings came from a whole bunch of fucking shit that I had nothing to do with, and it wasn't helping me, and I was hurting other people, including myself, I decided I had to base my life on something else. And what I based it on were principles. Hmm. You and I had conversations about principles. Like, okay, what is it that I can actually decide? We had a conversation today about accountability. Like helping out and picking up shit that's not yours. right? Uh -huh. or picking up your own shit first and then helping out. And I found principles to be the things that I wanted. I was running my life on my personality, which I have a lot of, but it wasn't necessarily helping me. Mm -hmm. So I make decisions now based on honesty, integrity, and kindness. Now, I don't always feel kind. I can be an asshole. I'm from Massachusetts. We call ourselves massholes. I love <laughs> that, right? <laughs> I'm half Italian. I mean, I said to you guys earlier that I know how to make cement, and I know where the river is. So she I still don't always think of She do. will kill someone. I will. I will. If I have, to. I have two instances where I almost did, and thank God I didn't. Um, Anyway, the point being is, is that anyway. <laughs> wait, wait, but wait, wait but I think that's <laughs> wait, but I think that's actually good to bring up because no. you've become one of the most amazing women that I know. But I think it it didn't start there. No, no. and I think many people would like meet you mm -hmm. and be like, oh. "Oh, this is amazing." No, like you had to go through the fire to and and work, like you said, to get to that's this right. point, mm -hmm. and. I think it may be interesting to touch on that because I remember th the story where you, f when you first went to a therapist and you like started saying, maybe you could just tell <laughs> yeah. the story. It's actually, I was sitting on a couch like this. My feet also didn't touch the floor then either. <laughs> and she was sitting over there and I'm the person that cleans the house before the person comes to clean the house. Yeah, You know what I mean? I'm that person. So I'm thinking about all the things I've got to tell her because I've got to, you know, start to go through my life. And I'm trying to get it in order. And I'm sitting on the couch, and she's a beautiful, old, gray-haired lady. Oh, like me now. Okay. And <laughs> I had black hair then. And she says, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Why now? Why are you here? I said, okay. And I want to get this right, because I'm an overachiever. I go, well, you know, I grew up in this poverty, and then I was sexually abused twice, and then my sister got pregnant by my stepbrother, and I start going through horrific things, like things that no one should have to go through. And I'm listing them in order as if I'm completely disconnected from what happened. And I'm trying to think, did it go right? And is that the order? And all of a sudden, I take a slight moment and I look up and this is what I see. I see this woman who's traumatized from what I'm saying, tears in her eyes. Hmm. And I'm so confused. I do the dog thing. Like, what? What? And I look behind me to see if something awful happened behind me. I'm in a fucking room with no one there. <laughs> and I'm looking for another reason why she would be so horrified about what happened to me. And Jake, I started to cry. And I didn't stop crying for a year. I cried at Buddhist meditation, three Al-Anon meetings a week, and Billy Blank's Taibo kickboxing standing next to Magic Johnson with my hair all in my face, crying. Because I stopped crying at 10 years old. Yeah. Because no one was going to show up. No one was going to help. So that's my start. Now, I will tell you, for the next 20-something years, um, after stopped crying, I kept trying to find my footing, and I'd get so far, and then I'd crash. And I'd get so far, and I would crash. And I finally had to crash and burn to the point and it's kind of like the phoenix. I think everybody knows the story of the phoenix where it burns up after living 100 years so it can get reborn and start a new life. What they don't know about that story is the phoenix builds the funeral pyre. It builds what it's going to lay on, and it burns itself up. Hmm. That's what it does because it knows in order to grow, it has to burn. So when we say crash and burn, to me, that's <clears> the start. That's the best start ever. And then you start to rebuild yourself one principle and one action at a time. That's what you do. Yeah, and I think that is the scary part 
It is. For most and all people is like, where do you start? Where do you begin? Knowing something's maybe wrong. Like, by the way, I would venture to say everyone. And I think therapy has this like weird thing. And it's like, especially with like kids my age and stuff. And like, you even would say it to someone and they're like, like, why why are you talking? Like, why are you talking to a therapist? Like, there's something wrong with everybody and you could always be a better human a better absolutely leader a better brother sister friend boyfriend girlfriend and i think it has this negative kind of connotation because i I was doing great in my life (laughs) like you know right i'm this successful person Mm -hmm. and all this stuff's going on like i have amazing friends amazing businesses blah 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 but i want i just still wanted to work on myself and i so i think a people like look at that as like a bad thing or if they're telling people something's maybe wrong or they want to change or they want to be better it like seems weird to other people so there's like this ego thing around starting to work on these things and find these things and to uncover these things but it's also so much easier to stay the same mm. and say stay in your default ways of just operating and going back to what you always do versus like knowing you're doing stuff wrong, acting wrong and could be better. Hmm. That's a lot to grasp and uh, to hold on to. Well, and it's like you said, you, you have to go back before you go forward. And that for me, it was the, this is the slay your dragon idea that the, the dragon being everything you don't want to confront is yeah. guarding <clears throat> the gold, which is everything you want. The dragon can, par- what's another way of saying it? The, everything you're looking for is right behind the door you least want to open. But this this dragon can be so intimidating and scary. And the idea of confronting it can be so overwhelming that a lot of people can just be paralyzed by it and never confront their dragon. For me, what I look at therapy work is like, it's, it's, it's a brother in arms to help you fight that dragon, to help you confront the dragon that you, without a therapist, might never confront. And that's, and, and that looking at it that way doesn't make it feel like something right. weak to do. It looks like it's, it's a battle. You're going into war together. You're going to war together. And or how about the fish can't see its own water? Mm. You know, the fish can't see how dirty the fish tank is. It can't see what's going on because it's in it. So we're all here in a community because we need that outside. We need that other person because I don't have the same agenda for you, right? Mm. So anybody that's talking to you has an agenda, you got to still be successful. You got to still pay me. You got to still love me, right? Yeah. So what's nice when you get a mental health co- mental health coach, and the reason why I do coaching versus therapy, even though I'm a licensed therapist, is I can come here. I can talk about this on this podcast. I can go places with you. You and I went up to my wild horse sanctuary and we worked with the horses. You can't do that as a therapist. And what about this? What about the fact that you're in crisis, or at least maybe not even in crisis, but you're in struggle? And I say, oh, well, we'll meet every Wednesday, Jake, at 2 o'clock. Is that good with you? And I write that down. But your shit hits the fan on Thursday at 10 a.m. You're going to wait a whole freaking week to call me? You and I text. We talked every day. You wrote shit down on yellow pads and stuck it on your mirror. Yes. (laughs) It was amazing how hard you worked. So it's quicker if you can coach. It's the same. You don't go in box one day a week and expect to get better. So why do we have a system? And I think the stigma is that detachment. It's that ability that I'm only supposed to talk to you once a week. Mm -hmm. You guys all have my number. You know if you text me, I'm going to respond. We're going to do the work at the moment that it's happening. And as successful as you were, you knew that there were things about your life and about your fear and sadness that could bring you down. Yeah. No, and they they were in in certain areas, for sure. And and mostly in close relationships with with family or or a loved one and i just wanted to be the best um that i could be and and i think there's always room to improve and that's why i think everyone should take that look in the mirror and and you know open open that door and i think they'll find so many answers to why in today's generation are more men struggling women struggling relationships aren't working um you know there's this void this massive void that needs to be filled social media and like you know self love 
is has become harder than ever and me dealing with that like in being in the public spotlight but it's no different just the social media of a kid in high school they're still getting judged there's still the hate comments mm -hmm. there's still and, and it doesn't go away on whatever level and so it's just looking going inward to find the answers uh, and to grow these grow your emotional intelligence and to and to grow that self-love that i really haven't spoken too much about i've obviously like talking about talked about psychedelics and all these things but i don't think uh we've gone in depth which is i think this is a great like first place to do that but i think like you said you talk to me on a regular basis we have that open line of communication and it's difficult to also find i think a good mental health coach yeah. life coach and or therapist and so that's i think another massive piece to this puzzle because like we were talking about yesterday just like teachers coaches mm -hmm. boxers whatever it might be mm -hmm. you know there's frauds out there mm. <laughs> there are and and there's you could talk to someone that actually like doesn't yeah. know what they're doing and and i actually knew i was struggling from 19 20 21 years old and i would try to find these therapists and these life coaches and there would be some progress made and there would be some helpful things and it felt good just to talk to someone mm -hmm. and i would get some key takeaways but no one ever addressed the root of the problem which is why i specifically think our work really clicked because the root of the problem was going back to childhood and all these learned behaviors and problems and traumatic experiences um and so for me that was kind of like the opening light to be like okay because you can't fix the problem if you don't go to the root and understand why you're doing the things it's like that an infection doing. right yeah doctor just doesn't cover over an infection it has to go deep it's systemic we actually talk about some of the illnesses that we have are systemic so you have to go back inside you can't just treat it from the outside and i think the other thing is we talk about tools takeaways you use the word takeaways the medical model in and of itself is troubling now trust me if somebody cuts my arm off or i kill over please take me to a doctor and i understand that I need to do the work on a daily basis to get better. I can't get better doing it once a week <laughs> on almost anything. So, and I also know that you talked about other therapists and doctors and pastors and everybody else. If you're not doing your own work, you have no fucking right to go help somebody else. Mm. Like, why is it that it's a, people say they take the Hippocratic Oath. And I go, no, they take the hypocritical oath. And I decided when I became a therapist that I was going to do the work too. And if I don't do the work, I have no right asking you to do the work. And you won't trust me. Now I'm sitting in a seat uh, of uh, uh, authority, and yet I'm not doing what I'm asking you to do? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I think the other thing too is that it's why peer support can help. It's why you guys talking to each other and helping each other maintain your principles. What it is that you want to do to be the people you deserve to be is also helpful. And anybody, and I, I ask this all the time of the therapist that I work with, like, what are you doing for you? What are you doing? Because you'll sort of cross from someone and they'll smell you a mile away knowing that you're a fraud, mm -hmm. that you're talking about shit that you're not doing. Is another big piece to it just compatibility? Because I... The first time I saw a therapist, I was fairly young mm -hmm. and it was the first therapist I went to. And we just happened to, our personality types just work together great. Unfortunately, she ended up passing away. And I, then I was looking for new therapists. And, and when, I, when we mashed up, I heard people talking about like not finding a good therapist and not having good experiences with therapy. I was just like, I don't, I don't know what they're going to because this is great. And this is one of the best decisions I've ever made. Then after she was gone, I was trying to find new therapists and I cycled through a lot that I just wasn't compatible with. Our personality types just didn't work together. And maybe value systems too played in. Um, but I think that's another thing too, is understanding that you, it might just take, you might have to shop a little oh my bit. God, you better shop. 
Yeah. They should give you a free. It's like, you know, if I was in TJ Maxx the other day and I said, hey, this stuff is on sale. If I take it home, can I bring it back if it doesn't fit? And they yeah. said, sure. Yeah. Like, well, why? <laughs> like, I can do that at TJ Maxx and I can't do that with a the therapist. Yeah. And that doesn't <laughs> make any sense to me. I want to say something else. It's so important. You went to therapy. Now, I work at a treatment center as well in Malibu. And every time I do a group there, I go, uh, wait, guys, where's your family? And I go, what do you mean? They sent me here. And I go, well, would you get here all by yourself? Let's talk about your story at seven years old, right? So if you're here for drugs and alcohol or whatever you're here for, why aren't they here? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't your family and mom, and maybe she was, she was. in therapy yeah. with you? Yeah. yeah. See, that's different. That's different. Your family in therapy, Jasper? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> They're a huge problem, and that's why I think like peer support can be like one of the most valuable things it is. you could ask for because for years of my life, it went from like, it was a common practice in my house to like be tough, right? So being tough, you can't be vulnerable. Like my dad, I never saw my dad cry about something or whine about something or complain or express his emotions. So in my mind, I'm like, why the fuck would I do that? Then I started living on my own and I felt like I didn't have peer support. So I felt like there was no solution but to just like get the fuck over it, right? I'm, I'm like trying to bury it. And it's, then do it again. <laughs> right. I meet these guys and I realized how broken I was and like how many issues I had and like even down to just being like defensive about it. People would tell me things and I'll get incredibly defensive. And like for so long, I was like, I don't need therapy. Therapy's stupid. They wouldn't listen to you if you weren't paying them. And then more recently, I realized how valuable of a thing it is. And like it. Uh, Not only valuable, but but quite contradictory to what you were told as a kid. It's 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 tough. It's a tough thing oh to do. God. It's not no, it's not this pussy thing to do to look at your but feelings. But in my in the way just, I was taught just, just was that it's pussies a, it's a are really strong. I just want to remember that. It takes a beating. <laughs> I, I always say you right, guys got the, the wrong metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my my dad actually told me to stop saying the word pussy cuz he he said he said it's a uh, they're one of the strongest things oh my God, yes. bring life into this world that's right that's right um, i gotta stop calling people but I, but then i was like <laughs> yeah exactly it's, it's like a compliment find something else it's a compliment because everyone literally every guy spends their whole life trying to get some so <laughs> that's you're calling real. you're calling Damn. Damn. you're and calling people tough. <laughs> pussies but but i was like dad oh you're so right dad but you said it growing up so it's in my fucking head exactly. literally learn behavior yes too <laughs> but learn behavior is a terrible thing it's it's my my dad and my brothers kind of gave me a real bad learning behavior growing up and he you guys actually became my therapist unwillingly um like through giving me a hard time and then me like deflecting it and then like i'll go to my room and digest it differently like while i'm by myself like ah they're right and they're telling me because they care and it just helped me feel like i could be more vocal and now i'm kind of i want to try therapy i think i should at, at the I think least, you deserve it. yeah. At, at the least, I encourage people to be able to. If if you're so big and bad, and therapy is just this soft, weak thing to do, sit in a room with yourself for like an hour and see how that goes. Like if you if you can manage doing that once a week, sitting in a room with your own thoughts, and like maybe you don't need therapy, but if that's threatening to you and you can't manage to do that, maybe you should reconsider how how uh yeah unless soft it unless is. you could be you know um basically a, a buddha and, and sit in the jungle with no stimulation right and no, no need, aggravation no <laughs> aggravation no yeah. need to fill a void right um then then most likely you're you can improve and and work on yourself and that's that's not a that's not a problem and i think in today's world we don't people don't realize the void inside of them that they're filling on a day-to-day -day basis they don't realize that like every time they subconsciously pick up their phone and start scrolling on TikTok and Instagram for hours that they're actually just filling this void of like social connection and validation, validation yeah, something needed. inside of them. Think about how much like, well, in, in my case, my mind was trained to believe that nobody gave a fuck, right? Like I'm not going to express anything because mm. if my dad and my older brothers who I should be the closest with don't give a fuck, why would you give a fuck? And That's why right. would you give a fuck? Mm. And why would anybody on planet earth give a fuck? So I'm just completely shutting it out, right? Like there, it's not preached enough that you should find that, you know? No, for sure. And so 
the the biggest thing I've said is if you know if one of your parents is always criticizing you and maybe they love you but never show it which i think is more common than not they're like super, they're like i super. love this kid mm-hmm. uh, they don't know how much i love them but you they, you don't show it you and you're and you're or you actually show it by criticism yeah, that's how i'm gonna make because you, you want them you want them to be better mm-hmm. so it's actually coming out of a place of like a, a good place but you just miss the ball and i think that's the more more, more common story and so people grow up how can they love themselves if the person that they fully need to trust and rely on for life, food, protection, safety, shelter until they're 18 years old, right? That's the age. Right. If that person comes across as hating them, then they're going to have all of these issues of not loving themselves. Um, and that first and foremost, I think, creates pretty much all of the other problems because you know there's this need to be more successful there's this need to drink when you're out because you don't have the actual real confidence uh, and ability to to love yourself and to to know what you're worth um and you know that's where the alcohol the drugs and the, or what a lot of people don't even realize that workaholics it's also a byproduct of not loving yourself because you're just trying to move up this social economic ladder. Why did not get that part? <laughs> I'd be bullshit. That's no, that's the part I got, and I yeah. bro, and I notice it still till this day that's right. that I literally work so I don't have to feel how I'm feeling, hmm. and it's this, it's this. Um, thing obviously i'm like working on filling these voids put down the alcohol all of these things but i literally notice it i'm like sitting there like just like not doing good yeah and and i'm like what do i do i'm gonna distract myself right with the eight companies that i have this is perfect because i I I don't have to think about what's going on in my head if i'm literally just working all the time you become a human doing instead of a human being you don't even know how to be yeah. But it's just it's just a band-aid. It's just a band-aid. I felt that when I met you when we were like in Canada and we were traveling and shit. That's why I like kept saying, like, nah, we gotta do some non robot shit because I used to call him a robot. Like I didn't feel like he was a human being. And we were becoming such great friends so quick. Like I felt it and I was like, Wow, this is great. Like I've never met a guy like this. And it would be so good up until it wasn't because he was like a fucking robot. And like I would check on him occasionally and he would like see it as as weird. Like, why the fuck are you checking on me? I'd ask him like, how are you doing today? Like, what's going on with you? How's your mental health? And like, he would see that as like alarming damn near. And then well, I'd- That's perfect that you said that because if you're in a family that's not safe and you're going to get criticized all the time or pushed or it's not good enough and you come in and ask how he's doing, how is he not going to see that as the same thing? So that idea that that's familiar when someone's checking on you to get you to do something or be better. So it doesn't have to be big trauma. You brought up the best thing. It's, I call it yeah, but parenting. Oh, that's really nice, Jasper, that you've got that shirt on, but why did you cut the sleeves off? Or that's really great, you know, Brandon. So condescending. It is condescending. It's also telling you that it's wrong. So when you use the word but, you take away the first part of the sentence. I love you, but. No, you don't. <laughs> like just don't even say the next part of the sentence then you know because if you say the next part of the sentence i'm not, i know you don't so yeah but parenting when people say i had a great childhood my parents were really supportive i go oh those are the people that scare me the most because they can't see anything that was not okay in there and we all have something it's what you said we all have something that wasn't perfect the parent though that says you know i really struggled with this when you were growing up and i'm really sorry and I see the effect of it now, and I'm not going to do it anymore. And you're going to have to go pay for the therapist to fix it because I did that. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot better for kids to understand that the parent can own what happened. If your dad said that to you, your mom, you're an anomaly, right? Your mom went and said, no, I need to find out too what's going on. Mm-hmm. I need to figure this out as well. Um, I had a great mom, uh, struggled a lot, and she was a great mom. So I had that person that I could fall back on. So when I needed to crash and burn and start over again, I had her in my head. I had that ability to say, wait, my mom did this several times. 
she taught me this, she gave me that, and she did her best. Um, and so I, I figured out, and I love what you're saying is, is that he was hyper vigilant because it wasn't always safe in his house. So why would he feel safe with any close relationship? You won't. Yeah, and it, and it, that's where it always comes out for people in some way, yep. and that they're either just in denial about it, mm -hmm. or it ruins things for them. And and I think um, some people will say, "Well, just get over it. Oh, get over it. Like, <laughs> just deal with it. Like." we've made it this far like what's it gonna change what's it, what's it gonna change and i and it always goes back to because i think that's one way to deal with it in the in the society and i've had close people to me say that like get over it get over it but you're actually just delaying a problem that's gonna happen further and down it's gonna the get line. worse actually yeah because it's gonna the more you stuff it down the more it's gonna come up in these moments and so it's actually what I'm doing and what this work is doing is actually getting getting on over it. it's get, no it's getting under, <laughs> under it. it yeah first. it's yeah. getting yeah. under it let's go beneath mm. the root of the problem and dig it out mm. and that's where the special work is to be able to like then let these things actually go that's right and then you practice the the antidote so we all want an antidote to something right we want something opposite so when I asked you about this new coaching and and you said, oh, my God, I had to do this thing over and over and over again for a long time to change a lot of what I'm doing in, with my body, with boxing. And that's how we change. So mental health is actually through your body. Like when I still want to yell and call names right, or put someone in cement, I don't <laughs> yell. I don't yell. I don't scream. I don't call them an asshole. What I do now is I take a few deep breaths. I understand why I'm sad and scared at that moment, that that person is doing something that reminds me of what happened before. And now I have the ability to change this outcome. I didn't as a child. That's why you don't stay a victim. That's why this work is so important is because at that moment, and you can do it in three seconds, I can go, oh, that's that person like my dad. They're doing what they did before. I'm reacting or could react the same way and I don't have to. It's not happening again. And this idea of emotional intelligence, most people think that emotions are different from thoughts. All the new science, thank God we get science most of the time right and it's a scientific fact until proven otherwise, so that changes. So, um, thoughts and emotions are the same thing. Mm. All right, you get one before the other, but they're, they're synonymous, they, they are together. So I can think something and feel something, but actually it's the same electrical energy. So then I now know that my thoughts and feelings work together. Here's what else I know. If I don't deal with that emotion at that moment and that thought, it is going to go down exactly what you said, Jake. And it's going to transform from fear and sadness to anger. So anger is not a primary emotion. I see the purple hat here. Purple is not a primary color. Do you know what you need to make purple? Blue and yellow. Yeah. Blue Jumping. and yellow will make green. What's blue and red? Fuck. Okay. <laughs> he was close. He Wait, got the blue right. Is it blue and, blue and red? Blue and red. red. Blue and red. Right? Okay. So that means that this doesn't exist unless we have blue and red. Am I correct on that? So anger doesn't exist unless you have unwitnessed, unprocessed, unacknowledged fear and sadness. So all that fear and sadness that you had and you talked about having was put inside of us. We couldn't express it. It was never acknowledged by our parents or anybody. And it turned to anger. That's why we get so irritable all the time in this irritation, frustration, anger, rage, and murder. That's the five levels. Oh, irritation, frustration, anger, rage, and murder. Mm. I still have irritation and frustration. I had murder. One time I had the knife. I didn't kill her, but I could have. And so I know now to manage my fear and sadness. What does that mean? I acknowledge it. You and I did that work. Like when I first started to talk to you about what are you afraid of, what are you sad about? The first reaction to most people is I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not sad about anything. I'm pissed. I'm like, okay. And if you were, you know, upset about this, you had fear and sadness, what would you be fear and sadness about? Well, I'm afraid that they don't love me. I'm afraid that they're going to leave me. I'm afraid that they're using me. I'm afraid and I'm sad that I can't give them what they want. You finally get 
to the root mm-hmm. when you take those those emotions and you go right down to the basics, right down to the red and blue so you can make purple. And the only other emotion you have mm-hmm. other than fear and sadness is joy. That's it. Happiness is subjective. You know, that it's subjective. I mean, what makes you happy won't necessarily make me happy, and yet we'll get in a relationship together and try to make each other happy. When in fact, what he likes, I don't like. And then we're confused. But what you do as an individual that gives you joy, you called me and said I was a dancer. If my day's not going well, or some people don't appreciate me, which happens a lot, sometimes, I go dance. I can give myself joy. I still get irritated in the, the grocery store. I want you to know that. I'm telling you straight up. I hate grocery stores. I go in, and this is why I hate it, because it goes back to my childhood. So I go in. I'm irritated. People are in my way. They don't move fast enough. They're like, they don't have their money out in time. And I'm standing at the checkout counter, and the person in front of me is having a personal conversation with the checkout counter person on my time. Hmm. On my time. They're using up my time. It's my turn. That's my whole childhood. <laughs> That's my whole childhood of all these crazy people using up my time and not taking me where I needed to go or do what I do. So now I'm in a similar situation. And once I put that together and I said, oh, This is that thing that happened when, you know, dad and mom and sister and brother were all acting out and I couldn't go where I needed to go. So you know what I do now? Take a few deep breaths. You're a great proponent of breath work. And I go into the grocery store and I start saying hi to everybody. I slow down. I go up to the checkout counter person. I go, how are you doing today? I don't really give a shit. Like all you (laughs) checkout counter people back in Agora, just know I don't really care what I answer. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm doing because it makes me a nicer person. Didn't yeah. I say one of my principles was kindness? <clears throat> so I can act on that fear and sadness that's all the way from the past, or I could actually practice being a nice person instead of an asshole. That's really <laughs> interesting. That's really interesting. Because there's even been times like on my, my, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but like on my self development journey, like there's been times where like you've, you've said to me, like you act like this nice put together guy in public but really you guys don't know like he's a piece of shit and it's like yeah like that's what i'm doing i'm practicing it is an effort like especially when i'm in public like here with my friends it's like my time to like of course i'm gonna you're gonna see the worst parts of me here but when i go into public like how i want to conduct myself in the world is a practice i don't always feel like being nice to everyone i don't always feel like being a respectable person that stands by their word but when i go out into the world i try and abide by it and practice it whether I feel like it or not. So that, that is interesting that like, regardless of how you feel, it is a practice and it, it can be mm-hmm. learned. And, and I think the other thing that happens is you'll trust your practice, your principles and your practice and your emotions more when you do that. Mm-hmm. Because right now you guys know, and, and I told you at your last fight when the guys were fighting behind me, and instead of being a nice little old lady sitting there, they were fighting and getting ready to do it, and someone threw a drink and it landed part on my back, I stood up and I stopped that fight. Don't fuck with me when you're acting out (laughs) because I also know how to be able to use that fear and sadness, bring it into anger, and then make sure everybody's safe. It was not going to happen on my watch. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's better to be a warrior in a garden exactly, than a gardener in a war. Like if you don't have that, dark side that you can tap into then you're just a pushover that's it. and then people are going to manipulate you and control you so it's it's and better to a have protector it's you're better a protector yeah yeah but it's better to have because also what i didn't realize is like i have that dark crazy side and that's where the profile picture comes from it's the half light mm-hmm. half darkness and once i accepted it and realized it and made allies with my dark side that's when i was liberated from these emotions that were controlling me before and so i was also able to just be smarter in certain situations and to use the light in certain situations but sometimes you have to pull that dark side out and so actually it goes back to the trauma being a superpower of sorts when you can figure it out and it's when it's not controlling you and you can let go of the bad parts of it but still hang on to the good parts of it because me trying to fill a void by working all the time that's kind of sad but like also it's fucking great because 
now I can retire whenever I want. <laughs> so like that trauma led me here. So that's why I say thank you, Dad. <laughs> thank you, Mom. <laughs> like right. like it's not all bad what happened. You still yeah. you still made a great kid and a great person. It just there's some fucking speed bumps that we all have. And I think even a lot of people like when I came out with the doc and on Netflix and people were like, Oh, this stuff with your dad. And my dad was kind of upset. It's like, yeah, we're talking about the negative things, which like I want to reiterate, like to, with my parents, like, yeah, we talk, we go in and we talk about the negative things and some of the bad things that happen because that's the entertainment industry. They want the juiciness. <laughs> that's right. They want the gossip. Mm -hmm. They want the clicks, <laughs> but there's also so many good things that came from all of those moments and, and, it's easy to kind of like forget about that, but they still, they still were amazing, amazing, amazing parents. I haven't talked to your mom a lot. I've got to watch her a little bit from a distance. Uh, one of the things I so appreciate about your mom is she was, is a want to know person. She's doing and has done some of her own work on herself. And she also tells you the truth which is wonderful. Uh, she's also a warrior in many ways. She's a great athlete, I understand, for when she was younger. She was a great athlete. Your dad I've also talked to many times, and his mind is so sharp. He is so bright, and he's oftentimes a far, so far ahead of what other people are doing. So sometimes he's moving faster than what other people can do to do experience that with him too. No, no, a hundred percent. He's, yeah. he's a, so he's, so genius. he's a genius. So my, my grandpa is like a super genius mm -hmm. and like hundred fucking 90 IQ, hundred like 80 IQ. Like you can't even talk to him because he's just in a different planet. He can like build a whole engine without a manual can read, upside read reads books upside down just for fun like my dad's a watered down version of that mm -hmm. it's a genius and then me and logan are somewhere up there too but like <laughs> it, it went from like super genius to like greg to like <laughs> we're down there a little bit but but yeah my dad like still to this day i like think of things that he taught me and said and it like comes back up and i'm like wow he was he was ahead of his time. And you said it best earlier, too. He had his own trauma. He shared with me stories, and I won't share them here. He shared with me stories of what he had to go through as a little boy mm -hmm. and what that meant. And because he didn't have the benefit of doing what you're doing, like my hope is that every parent does it. I don't care how old you are. Go back and figure out what happened to you, how it helped you and hurt you, and go back and talk to your children and tell them, tell them the truth own your shit, and then be the parent that they deserve them to be now, right? Do it now. It's never too late. And then you guys are also parenting each other. I used to call you Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's when I first yes. met Jake. That's why I would call you guys. And on some level, that's true, right? Like you left home. You're looking for a new way of being. All of you found each other to do this. So now the key is, and the thing is, how much are you going to help each other and hold those boundaries and that healing now mm. or you're going to let each other come in and just do the the basics mm. and it, it can't be that here you've got a leader that's already going further and doing and opening up you can't do it here mm. so now we invite everybody here on the island it's like it's even the island i don't know who captain hook is but the fact remains <laughs> is that is that you guys get to do that for each other mm. you deserve to do it for each other Right? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Ca okay. Captain Hook is probably the the world yeah. we're, we're facing. Oh yeah, there now you go. and and society, like all the issues, social issues, you know, educational issues, the dollar not being shit, like and hedonism too. Yeah, it's hedonism and, big... and mental health is um, actually infectious, or I should say, mental illness. Hmm. I want you to know that people don't talk enough about that which is why it's so important for you guys to do the work here. All of you do the work, not just the leader, not just one, all of you. Because mental illness is absolutely able to be passed down and passed around. Like, you know, we talked about the flu. Yeah, well, let's talk about mental illness as well. That can happen. And I, I think that's imperative that we understand it. Well, I think that's probably why there's been so many, like, these echo chambers in Twitter mm -hmm. where other people can find 
other like-minded people way easier. Yes. And if it's this like victim mentality or mental illness mentality, they just get stuck they do. in those groups and you are who you surround yourself with. You will be the people you hang out with. Can yeah. we can we talk about victimhood? I think that's a great great topic mm -hmm. and <clears throat> Jake you you before we're talking about the things that have happened to you in your life and you're talking about how they're good things that ended up happening to you because they made you into who they are and I think the discrepancy that needs to be made is that the things that happened to you are, are neutral they, they they weren't good nor bad it was you and how you decided to contend with them and what you decided to take from them that made them into these good life lessons um there, there's there's two routes to go. There's well, my favorite quote is, "With every adversity comes the seed of equal or greater benefit." But it's up to the individual to find the benefit in the adversity. Mm -hmm. And you're speaking about it because you you you've refused to live a life as a victim. You're speaking about it as if it's just objectively good that those things happen because that's how you that's your that's your worldview. Is like, okay, if something shitty has, ha shitty has happened to me, I'm not gonna be a victim to it. I might as well assess the situation, deal with it, contend with it as it happens, and learn find the lesson that's in there to be learned and be stronger on the on the outside but i see a growing 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 culture of of victimhood and where it's just oh poor me this is happening to me and fuck the world i might as well just sit here in my misery and yeah this I, is the card i'm dealt I, I got to witness that in real time because and I, I realized super young that not everyone has those like resilient takeaways from like like trials and tribulations or just things you go through because i have three older brothers who went through just as bad and if not worse things than I went through. And like, we all experienced these things together and my takeaways on those things were so different than some of theirs. And even some of those things have them like more mentally handicapped to life and they can't adapt to life as well as I can or just like any situations and they victimize themselves. Like I'm not doing this because of this shit happened or like, I don't want to change how my life is because of what we went through when we were young. And I'm looking at them like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Like even down to like my financial situation and my ambition to change that and break the cycle of the things we were going through when we were young compared to like their mindsets. Like they're watching me wake up, leave the house as soon as my eyes open and come back at night, just trying to figure something out day in, day out and evolve them. And they just fell short time after time and like went back to that victim mentality. So I got to see that in real time. Mm. And I just had to realize young, like not everyone has those, those takeaways. But do you think, so I, th I think it'd be good for you to explain to a little bit. Like, I think it probably from hearing you talk about this before stems from your dad and the situation that y'all were in and your dad kind of being the one who's like, that you were just talking about this, like, 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 what do you mean? Like he was, he was a bunch of evils and negatives in, in my life. It just depends on. Well, wait, you're onto something, Jake. And, and you're right. He was a bunch of evils because of his own trauma. He stayed a victim. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Here's what other children do. And you're actually, you did it. I did it. You did it. Children oftentimes try to balance out a parent that is extreme. So think about that for a second. So there's so many things we can talk about. Each one of these topics we could do a whole show on. So you're the baby in the family. Mm -hmm. You watched dad, mom, older brothers all struggle. Yeah. They all had the party line. They all sort of went down the same road. And you come out this little thing and go, wait a minute, all those people going that way. I'm going the opposite way. So That's, we don't need uh, another absolutely. one of those. And so children oftentimes balance out the extreme yeah. of the parent. Now, they can align with the parent, one parent, and be the opposite as well. So knowing that, knowing that you knew one more person like that in the family, the whole family was going down. Did you not know that? I, I knew that, absolutely. And I, I, used, to, I used to say when I was young, I was like, if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. it. No bingo. one's going to change any of these things that are going on. And it just yeah. catapulted. So that know. answers partly your question about how, why are some people resilient? Why do some people go through? Because hmm physically if you really think about it we're all victims as children right 
Would you agree? From the sense that we're just, we're, yeah. we're helpless. We we're can't. helpless. We're yeah, helpless. Sure. I mean, we come up with the most helpless baby that comes out of a body, out of a person, right? A mother. And the whole animal kingdom. And the whole animal yeah. kingdom. No, no other worst. animals have to that's wait 18 right. years. That's, that's exactly right. Like, we're the worst. We yeah, Man. exactly. So, on some They're level, really. we are so dependent, I can use that yeah. word, yeah, that, which yeah. then makes us have to absorb what's going on in our family. And what I love is that there are, there is, I should say, there is and are all these people in the world, and it's important to find them, that say, I'm not going down that road. And it might be as simple as what I just said about Jasper, that there were too many in the family already going that route, and one more would have collapsed the whole thing. Absolutely. So on one level, he was still victimized, and on another level, he was smart enough to say, we can't get another one of those. Hmm. You might have been that same kid that there was something going on you for sure. It's like, okay, everything's going this way. I'm going the opposite. He's second born boy. I'm second born girl. That's not an accident. Mm -hmm. And even science lets us know where your position is in the family has a lot to do with how you experience the family. Mm. That's just true. Like you'll never be first born. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, that's the one first you will never get. You'll get a lot of other firsts. You and I will always be second. Losers. How many, yeah, how many, how many times do we, like, do you ever go into an event and go, oh, I'd like to be second? Your brother walks in firstborn every time. You heard that as a kid. So did I. You know what that did to us? Fuck that shit. I'm going to go be first in something else. Yeah. It's that, that sometimes it's that simple. It's it's even down to like uh, when we're all getting into a car, I'll just get in the back seat and like, <laughs> I'll let you get in the passenger seat just because that's how it was when I was young. But on a, on a on a bigger level, like when my brothers, they used to teach me things and then I would get better at those things in them. And then they'd be like, fuck you. They don't want to play with me no more. Like Yu-Gi-Oh, my brothers taught me how to play Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm like, I want to play. First day I learned, I beat my brother and he's like, I don't want to play with you no more. He teaches me how to skate. I started jumping off shit. He quit skating. And it just turned into this like this weird fucking thing, but that that is so very true. Like I don't even realize that sometimes I'll just Yeah, I, th I think also subconsciously parents will say, like, oh, I love all my kids equally. I think it's bullshit. I do too. Because because there's not gonna be as much joy, happiness, and emotion the, with the second or third kid. The first time's always the best. Whether it's Damn. taking shrooms. <laughs> Getting drunk, <laughs> so or except real. sex, except sex, except sex. See, but I think I'll <laughs> but the first time is always the yeah. best. And yeah. so, the f imagine the first time you're a parent and you find out you take the pregnancy test. We're gonna have a kid. You're subconsciously going to love the firstborn more. Way more way Naturally, more. that's your pride and joy. When it first comes out, the first couple of years, you're gonna be like spending more time, putting more thought and effort. Buying better gifts. Dude, this is great. Fuck my and then dad. it comes the second the second one, you're like, oh, this is great. Like, we're pregnant again. It's still whatever, but it's it's, it's and then they rely more on your on your and older you're brother. Different. To... Yeah, you're different as a parent. I want to say something else. So if there's there's two years between you and Logan. Yeah. Yeah. There's 18 months between me and my sister. The 18 months that went between my my sister born and me, shit happened in the family. It wasn't the same childhood. It wasn't the same experience from my mother, so I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, and you're and they're jaded. Like at first, the the parent probably has like so much more patience. They're probably more forgiving, and then eventually, like when you get older, it's like fuck, like <laughs> shut up, like shut the fuck. Is up. that is that where my neglect, my like neglectful childhood came from? Because I'm the youngest, and I have four older brothers. My and but it's such big age gaps. Like I have a brother that's like probably like I'm 22. He's probably 39 now, maybe 40. Mm -hmm. And I lived with him and I have a 30 year old brother and a 26 year old brother. So like by the time my dad had me, he was 37. He was like, I'm trying to just live my life oh, for sure. And he heavily relied on my brothers to raise me. And they were like, we don't want to take care of no dumbass kid. <laughs> so I couldn't go. even do kid shit. That's right. There you Fuck go. my parents. You didn't have the, oh, too bad you weren't a little girl. Then you would have gotten everything. Oh, you know, what were you going to say? You I was just going to so? push back for the sake of pushback. And I'm not a parent. You are. So maybe your, your opinion <laughs> and a is parent. much more valid. But just to push back on that a bit, I could also see it from the other angle where a lot of the times when, when parents have their firstborn kid, it can be a lot of stress. They can be way, way more neurotic because it's their first time going through the whole thing. So it's a really stressful neurotic experience. I see it a lot where they're hovering over the kid. They're worried about everything. When the second one rolls around, they're actually like they've done it before. So they're able to have like a more balanced 
parenting experience with but that kid. But neglect can also come from there because mm-hmm. they there's so much more leniency and they just don't give as much of a fuck. Like and they're not stressed. Uh, that that I think that's a good thing that the parent is stressed to like hover over and watch everything and to think carefully. And to yeah, put more time do. into more, they educate everything. you more. They're more attentive. Like by the time we roll around, we try. They just don't give a fuck about nothing. They won't scold you as much as they scolded your older brother. So like all of those little things that compound when you get older to have like those iron type morals. Sometimes you're lacking those. Mm-hmm. Where are you in the family lineup? We didn't talk about you. I'm I'm a, I'm a middle child in my house. I, I grew up a middle child. Okay, which is also there there's science about that. You know, we research everything. The firstborn oftentimes follows in the footsteps of the same gender parent more times than not. So I want you to think about that. The firstborn child follows in the footsteps of the same gender parent more times than not. Not always. More times than not. They oftentimes align with the father or mother. Sometimes it's opposite. But remember, it's only them. Was true in your family? Is it true? It's super true. Super true. My my, my father and... My older brother, my oldest brother, so alike they hate each other. Yeah, that that's the same with me. My, my when mm-hmm. I see my dad and my brother argue, I'm just like <laughs> they're the same person. Like, the same they're, they're just argue. They're just, might as well talk to actually, a mirror. <laughs> and right. it, and it's crazy because my brother's a junior, so he's even named after my dad. They fucking hate each other because they're so <laughs> similar. <laughs> they they just butt heads. My dad will be like, "You you ain't shit," and he'll complain about these things he's doing. And I'm like, "Damn, these are things you were doing when I was young." They're the same person. So is that true in your family? So you see the, the firstborn. Firstborn. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. yeah. See, and so that's interesting. Now, secondborn, we're like, we're out of here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're middle. I'm mm-hmm. middle child too. So we're out of here. We're like, oh, I'm not going. There's already three people like that. We don't need to go there. We literally have to go find our own way. Yeah. And by the way, we're all sitting on the couch here, right? You're an interesting baby of the baby child. Um, because oftentimes they are given a lot of attention because it's the baby. I wish. Right? So so you're a bit of an anomaly because the, the mother oftentimes knows this is my last one. So, you know, it's my baby. And they actually uh, introduce you that way. Uh-huh. She loved heroin. Yeah, that was well, her pride and joy. That was her baby. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, that's important to honor. I mean, you know. But I, I don't know. I, but, like, do you think she was, like, sweet to you, though? Fuck no. She used to be like, the only reason I don't beat you how I beat your brothers is because you're too young. It'll kill you. <laughs> and she hated me because I looked like my dad. Yeah, she you know, she was like out of her fucking mind. Like, yeah. Like completely out of her mind. I'm not tripping out. She, Did you know she was out of her mind, though, even as a little when kid? When I was young? Uh, no. I, I, well, yes, because like she would, she, the things she would do, like she used to like beat the shit out of my brothers and I and them a lot more. But then my dad would like take us away and then she would call and be like, I'm never going to put my hands on you guys again. And then we'll go over there for like two days and then she'd get to beating everybody. I'm like, damn, what the fuck? You just lied. Yeah. So like I, I kind of realized she was out of her mind, but I was too young to like fully pay attention to that. I was just was like, bro, we got to get out of here. That yeah. was. It's it, the reason I ask you that is because when a parent is violent, the child most of the time knows that they're out of control. Oh, yeah. Right. You know it. You're looking at this person, even when you're little, going, holy shit, this person's out of control. When you are just constantly critical, they call it that. Remember I talked about that Yabat parent? Well, it's Mm -hmm. really good, Jake, but why do you feel it? That is like water torture. Mm -hmm. That's like constant little, I call them a a thousand emotional paper cuts. We just keep little cut uh, to your emotions. And then you can't tell if it's you or them. You actually believe them. Mm. So what's lucky for you in a very odd way is that you knew she was out of control. Yeah. Right? So that you had a chance to separate yourself. I moved out when I was like 15, 16. I realized like even my dad, like he wasn't as crazy as my mom. Like my dad calmed down in my later years of life. Like when I, like by like ninth grade, I would say he just Mm -hmm. gave up because like I, I was so focused on other things and like. I, I was really lived my, I had a whole life I lived already. Like I felt like an, an adult. Yeah. So he kind of just drew back a little bit. Then when I dropped out of school, he was just like, yeah, this, and I moved out. He just felt like, all right, it's over. All right. And Jake, when did you leave home? I was 17. Yeah. Do you know that uh, 35% of all military men and women come from horrific childhoods? They go into the military with PTS. They go in because they're looking for a safe place. Mm, Being downrange, being on a battlefield was actually safer than some of their living rooms. Like they at least knew the enemy. 
they knew that that person was against him when your parents are supposed to be, you know, there for you and be the protector. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that kids also know enough to leave. It's funny that I wanted to go to the military. It is. We <laughs> talked about that. We talked about that. Navy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I was going to do before mm -hmm. I got Vine famous. Yeah. Which is funny. Which is also, if you think about it, that call, that Vine famous that you called it, that gave you a way out. Yeah. That gave you a way out. You developed your own way to get out. Yeah. It's kind of like mute music, but like I was... Mm -hmm. I, I was just like terrible where I was from. I'm from South Central. Like obviously everything mm -hmm. around me is just like terrible and I'm a product of my environment. Music kind of was that for me. It was my big out. Like, I don't know. It's very, very similar mm -hmm. stories in ways I didn't even realize until you like mm -hmm. open that up. Yeah. And you are a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So you went job, and made man. stories. You went and lived through the film. Is that not correct? You were yeah. filming other people's lives. Yeah, but, a bit of both. Yeah, it was mine and, and others, yeah. And yours and others. When I first went out, it was, yeah, it was actually more focused on mine. Yeah, which is great because you had to tell your story. You were mm -hmm. looking for a way to tell your story. Mm -hmm. So at home, was your story accepted? Were you open? Was it something people wanted to hear? We've 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 been through this, me and Susie, a couple times. <laughs> and I, I, I refused because I had I had a dang good life. So I, did. I, I refuse to like, I, I hate I hate digging for like faults in it because it's it it's it, like it was fine and like I even I even hesitate to say like like that like yeah I guess I did feel misunderstood and like you know whatever as a Isn't kid and that that's okay? why I get into, it is it is it is but yes yes the answer is yes I yes I think I, I, I like how he views it though because that's the life I want to give my children mm -hmm. I want to be an amazing father and an amazing husband and I don't want my children to have those same takeaways on life that i had like it's a crazy luxury to, for your children to be able to say yeah i lived a dang good life like your parents did a spectacular fucking job mm -hmm. um i would disagree in what sense they get, like i love that. there's so much that you deal with i agree it, yeah. it's cool like if your parent if your parent was like there for you which i think they were in a mm -hmm. different and loving way mm -hmm. but they also still like allowed you to abuse the thing that was hurting you the most which was adderall yeah i think that was after i left home like i, I it's, it's i think it, like, i started i mean bro i was like taking prescription opiates in high school without them knowing like they, my mom didn't know that until why why are you taking them? What did you need? What did they do for you? I'm not even saying they them. Got high. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. High from what? So high, high means feeling better. High means I'm happy. That's the euphemism for happy, right? Low is depressed. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So it made you feel better from what? I don't. I. I'm. I think. I thought for a long time, and I still kind of think that I just liked getting high, like just the, just the euphoria of it. Um. But if I had to guess, yeah, it was probably it was probably this this feeling of maybe like being misunderstood, being the middle child syndrome of like, okay, I'm a bit different than most people around here, and I feel a bit misunderstood from that. That's a bit frustrating. So maybe I'm gonna resort here. Was to, it a peer thing though? Like where your boys doing shit? Where you're just like, fuck it, I'm gonna get high with the homies or? Yeah, some of that's yeah, also I had a, like one friend that we were getting high together. Like, yeah, I mean that's time. also a real I think thing. I, I don't know, part of it I think I just like getting high. Like, but what well, when did you start taking Adderall? Adderall I, I was first prescribed Adderall when I was probably 16, 17, 17. Cuz you couldn't focus having yeah. trouble in school? Yeah. Hmm. Which by the way, I think this is an important thing to touch on too. Being somebody who's been prescribed Adderall been prescribed Xanax, Clonopin for anxiety. These are things now. I've, it's it's taken me a long time to get here, but these are things now that I, I realize are they're band aids yeah. for a symptom. They're they're not even band like the depression or anxiety. Those aren't. That's not even the thing. Depression, anxiety are a symptom of the root cause of these things. That's and right. then you're taking things like medication to band aid the symptom. That's you're right. not even band aiding the cause. So that's that's been like a. Not to get away from what we were just talking from, but I, I, I want to touch on it because that was my biggest takeaway. Spending years and years taking different prescription medications. and No, I think it all falls under the same category of a void. That's yeah. right. That, There's that something is needed, wrong with you. That is needed to be filled. And I think some people have 
bigger voids than others. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone has it for, for different reasons. Yeah. But also, if you... Yeah, I don't know. There, I guess there has... I, I don't. I feel like there's parts of your story that don't add up. To, and like, so, so here's the thing, man. I don't think I had some perfect life. I just think that, like, of course, of course, everybody, everybody's life could be better. But I just think, but that's not what we're saying. We're not. We're not measuring good mm-hmm. or bad. I get. I, I, what I think it is, is that I hesitate to like pick things apart because considering the circumstances, I just think my parents did such a damn good job that I guess I do because of that hesitate to like pick apart the faults in it because everybody can pick apart faults. And I understand like when, when there's some things that I need to get to, bottom, to the bottom of for mm-hmm. my own well-being, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And we've done right. that. Me and my family have done that. But there's also some things where it's like at a certain point, it feels like we're, it's, it's almost picking too much because at the well, end of the day- Someday you won't, or you won't be able to figure out at all. Like mm-hmm. I'm still figuring out stuff. I still could say, oh my God, that's why I do that. I forgot about that that happened. And if you're not willing to take a look how it's affected you, you won't, you'll also miss some of the great things that Mm -hmm. were done. That's why we're not picking it apart to just say every parent did everything wrong or not good enough. I think we also, though, if if we're not careful and we don't want to take a look at why was I prescribed all of this stuff, that is giving you the message, Brandon, that there was something wrong with you and it needed to be fixed. And the way it needed to be fixed was by giving a pill. Yeah, and I, but or taking a drink, and that most <laughs> definitely is a problem. But I don't, I don't think my parents are at fault for that. Like my parents didn't know all the negative side effects of these medications that I was being prescribed. A lot of people didn't know at the time. Mm-hmm. We're we're just finding out a lot of this, so I don't blame my parents for for not locking up the opiates that were in the the the. The bro, I just I wanted to get high. Right, like I don't blame my parents for letting me get prescribed certain things because they didn't. They did genuinely didn't know. Now that we do, my mom definitely feels some guilt for that, and she yep. definitely she's not she's not happy with it. But I don't I don't blame her for that. I blame more like I blame the pharmaceutical companies for that. Like I blame definitely and society and school. I mean, we haven't even talked about that. We didn't talk about the fact you were bullied in school. We didn't talk about all of those other ways, racism. Like there's so many things that happens to kids. It isn't just parents. And they are the gatekeepers. And I will tell you, Brandon, as a mother, because you said I'm a mother and a grandmother, I am so grateful that I can own what I didn't do well. Yeah. Do you know what that does for my daughter when I own the stuff that I see I helped create mm-hmm. and her father and, and this world in many ways? I can't even tell you the freedom and the joy. And I'm such a better grandmother than I say was as a mother, because my job is to get better as I go. So I can only say in defense, and so not no, in support of your mother and your father, they're going to love to know what they did well and what they didn't do well. And I, I think my mom re- does a great job of that. Just three days ago, she texted me, and I don't know where this came from, but she texted me and she said, hey, baby, I was just thinking about you today, and I wanted to say that I'm sorry if I ever inadvertently crushed your amazing spirit You've always been so full of life and wonder and energy. And sometimes that was difficult when you had to fit into places that you didn't know what to, where we didn't know what to do with you. Sometimes I did a good job advocating for you, but I know there were times when I dropped the ball and for that, I'm sorry. I know how much you love me and I know that you don't hold any of it against me, but I just feel the need to tell you this. I love you. I love you and your crazy, amazing mind reminds me of mine so much. I'm so glad God made me your mom. So I do, I, like, I think she does an incredible job of like owning up and like she, she wants to be the best, just like I want to be the best version of myself. She wants to be the best mother for me. And part of that is taking accountability for. Put that on your social media and tell everybody, every parent to write mm. a note like that. Mm. Write a note like that. You got one from your mom. Yeah. 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 In person. In person. But it was, it was, it was crazy because me and my parents never had any emotional conversations like i couldn't go to them and be like hey this is how i'm feeling Mm -hmm. because i was just afraid that they would judge me criticize me why are you feeling this way what happened they'll shoot it down yeah shoot it all down so the first time i ever had an emotional conversation with my was with my mom it was like two years ago and she was like just like i'm sorry that like I just was doing the best that I could That's right. and figuring it out day by day. And I think again, like none of this episode or anything is, or the work that Susie and I do was to like make anyone feel worse. If anything, 
all of our work brought us closer together mm -hmm. to understand my parents to understand what they went through with their traumas to understand that they were literally i already knew my mom was just doing the best she could mm -hmm. she didn't even have to say that but when she said it i was like oh my god and she's she's like i'm sorry and you know i'm just continuing to be better and my mom's made a, an amazing changes and has become again one of the greatest women i know in this world so it's like i already knew those things through doing this work but having that emotional conversation with her was just like crazy but it also felt super good i didn't even know how to respond i was just like yeah yeah oh, oh i love you I, I love you too and i was like tr i was gonna cry but i stopped myself from crying because that's like my natural mm -hmm. response and then i was just like yeah so like so what so what are we doing later and i because i didn't know how to do, i just didn't know how to like act yeah in that situation but yeah I've, I've never had an emotional conversation with my dad either i think dad that would be nice i know you'd be watching these i need you to tap in <laughs> like bro i well, you I, have to do it for him yeah i've yeah, done you, it for him i remember i showed you that long ass message I, I sent my dad a incredibly long paragraph uh when i was dropping out of school I was, it was 2016. I was telling him like, just about how I want to chase my dreams and my blueprint and how I feel he doesn't support me. And like, he could be a better father sometimes and just a better support system. And what did he say? K. He literally <laughs> just responded K to a book. That's I, I showed it to him. Crazy. I showed it to him. A huge, and I'm like, like I, I'm, I'll be losing my mind sometimes. All I want to do is take care of you guys and, and break the cycle and da, da 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 da. In 2016, I'm 15 years old at the time, texting my dad this and all he says is K. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I just feel I, like I think that's more uh, common than not. Maybe. I don't know. But like, I think more, more, most kids probably feel like they can't go to their parents. Yeah. Which is odd, isn't it? Yeah. It's weird. It's odd because it should be the safest place you could go mm. and, and this. And I think that we have to understand what does it mean to actually be a parent and actually have a child. I think we have children before we actually understand what it really means. And I think, again, we're the only animal on the planet that keeps our children children for so long. And therefore, we're not always helping them go out into the world, which to your uh, point is emotional intelligence. We're supposed to help you um, figure out how to navigate this world in the best way possible for you to create the life you want, not the life we want. And when I used to tell my grandson when he was really little, my job is to keep you safe. And then all of a sudden at five years old, he gets leukemia. And I got slapped in the face because I said, oh, wait, I was supposed to keep him safe. And I realized I can't always keep him safe. No one had any, any control over that. So I had to go back to him and apologize and say, you know what my job is? I made a mistake. He goes, what's that, Jima? And I said, my job is to teach you how to keep yourself safe. That changed everything for me. Because all of a sudden now, I'm there helping him leave, wow. not helping him stay to make me feel important. That That is so, so, so crucial because that's something I see a lot with mothers. I think they call it the devouring mother, where mothers find so much and derive so much value from being a mother and being there to protect their kid yep. that when it's time for their kid to go out into the world, mm -hmm. they want to keep their kid there for them, selfishly want to keep their kid there for themselves. And that is so, so terrible to do to someone. It is. And and then, then cause then the, let's say the son ends up still living in the world of the mother far, far past when he should. Now he's 30, year, 30 years old and still dependent on his mother to be there for him. Mm -hmm. And not or only that- Or can't have a relationship because they're afraid of being smothered. Mm. So remember that, that thing about going opposite. Mm. So a parent can quote unquote, love you so much that they smother you. And then you're like, oh my God, love means not being able to breathe means I'm not able to go and make my own mistakes and do my own life. So mm. it can go both ways, right? It can keep you tied or, or it can actually push you away so that you're afraid to be vulnerable to somebody else. That's something I'm so, so grateful for because I was, I was 18, I was a kid when I decided I wanna move as far across the country as possible, all the way to LA from Pennsylvania. And I just graduated high school and that, I mean, I'm so grateful because when I, it was very abrupt when it happened and I told my mom, I, I'm, I wanna buy a ticket and move to LA. And she like she let me know selfishly, this is terrifying and I want you to stay here, but I know I need to let you go. She kicked my ass out and got out there and I would not be here today if it wasn't for that. So that's I, I'm so grateful for that yeah. and that she was willing because as a mother, selfishly, you're not going to ever want to do that. 
but it's uh yeah god that's mm-hmm. crucial yeah my grandson came home the other day and he was standing in the kitchen he says you know jima and mom i'm gonna go work on a cruise ship and i went that's a great idea on <laughs> some mm-hmm. yacht oh he wants to go a private yacht not a cruise ship right and i went how do we get you there what do you <laughs> like i'm one of those parents mm-hmm. now grandparents are like however i need to get you there let me know yeah go on your adventure yeah go, go on your adventure go do it now Go yeah, while them. you're young. Yeah. Make the mistakes. Yeah. Do it now. Start now. Right. And yeah. and start and start taking these looks at yourself yes, now. Now. And start your healing now. Because everyone likes to just put it down the road. It's like going to the gym. That's right. And yeah, you're gonna realize going you to have, the dentist. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna realize you have more problems than you do now. Right. But that's life. It is life. And and you're gonna fix oftentimes if you clean up yourself then the rest of your life is actually going to fall in place. Because you can't have a half sunken ship. That's right. And Jake, what does your t-shirt say? If you met, I wore this on purpose. (laughs) If you met my family, you'd understand. (laughs) I should. (laughs) We all need one of those. (laughs) You know, I am the only one that left my home too and came out here, came out to California. Really? Yeah. So there's simpatico here Mm. of us, of us being the different ones, the disruptors in in the the world and i'm grateful i'm grateful for that can i attempt to close one unclosed loop i think we have here just because this has been uh i don't i don't know if i should consider the audience as much as i do but i'm always trying to think of like what people are going to be saying in the comments and how we can discuss it before i'm glad someone is because i don't give a shit (laughs) yeah right and i know jake doesn't either jake doesn't you're good at that you're good at that that, so something that i I think i can see because also the way that's actually important though like i don't care what the comments say because like you have to fucking figure it out for yourself right because guess what i figured out all oh. of this by <laughs> my know, fucking this, self. This, this, this so, version of Jake. So, I like so literally, I literally, like, there's always the comment, yeah, but you don't know, like, what I'm going through. And, like, you had this. Shut the fuck yeah, up. Shut the literally fuck shut the fuck up and figure it the fuck out. Not everything is the perfect roadmap. This episode isn't a perfect blueprint for you to fix your fucking life. We should put the whole episode like, in reverse. Literally, like... <laughs> by the way, you're closing the loop for me right now. Keep going. Dude. Everybody just thinks that they're going to watch one podcast or read one book and everything's going to be fucking dandy. And guess what Susie said in the beginning of the episode, this is the problem is people don't fucking listen. She for 20 years had to work on this and Mm. would go and fall again and go and fall again. And I'm doing the same thing, by the way, I'm getting slightly better and then fucking up and then slightly better and then fucking up. And we're all going through this as humans and each person has their own struggles, their own thing that they're going through, their own thing that they're trying to figure out. And it's the it is the actual comments and the fucking people who want to sit here and depict anything that we just said or how dare you talk about mental health in this way or ah, da, 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 or right. your parents <laughs> are trying to psychoanalyze me or anyone sitting here or psychoanalyze like what happened with your parents and oh yeah well this is good and that's good and that's bad and this is shut the fuck up worry about your own life figure your okay. shit out yeah, yeah and and get better every every single day this is a launching pad and and uh, some helpful tips and pieces of advice that have helped us it may not work for you uh or it may be the best thing that you've ever podcast you've ever watched and batteries are sold separate fuck yeah that's <laughs> that you there you go you, he, did he close the loop <laughs> that, I, that was the no, loop. No, what I, my my closing of the loop yeah that's that needed to be said absolutely um all i was going to say is but just because this is like a softer episode and we're talking about emotions i just want to make this discrepancy that contending with your emotions is not the same as being reactive to your emotions because we're talking about Mm -hmm. contending with our emotions doesn't mean that on a regular basis, when I feel sad, it's always appropriate to cry. When I feel angry, it's always appropriate to lash out. There's a time and a place to contend with your moments and emotions. And then there's a time and a place to not to say, fuck your emotions and do what you need to do regardless of your emotions. Just because we're talking about contending with emotions doesn't mean you always need to be emotional. I think there's, that's just, and it's not, and it's also, this episode is also not to like, criticize our families or parents or nah, fuck kids or anything like that yes let us do that behind the scenes like i feel comfortable to share these things because i have a platform and i believe that it is my responsibility in this world to help share my story so that others can learn from it and get better from it and take inspiration or motivation from it because i do have this platform i'm young i'm a young man I'm successful has gone through a lot of these things and I have a very large audience and 
that is why I speak on these things. It's not to be a victim. It's not to mm. shame my dad or to make myself feel better. Oh, thanks, guys. Like, uh -huh. now I've told my story and I feel better. This is not for any of that. It's not for any of that. And my dad's an amazing dad. My mom's an amazing mom. My Jasper's dad's awesome. Like, everyone's everyone were here yeah. and and they did their best and it's it's not for any of that either you know i did once just to help you out with how parents also learn from owning their stuff so it's not us complaining about them it's giving them the right just like you got that uh text so one day i was standing at the ranch and some woman, young woman was saying, oh, you must have been an amazing mom. I go, no, no, I really fucked up all it. No, I can just tell you weren't a great mother. And I go, hang on one second. And I took my phone like this and I went like that. And I said, Kirsha, can you tell this person exactly how much I fucked up as a mother? And I went like that. And she goes, oh my God, she fucked up so much. You wouldn't believe it. I have had to be in therapy for years. And blah, blah, blah. It was the best moment ever. Maybe I maybe I have like a bit of a romantic view of my mother. I, th I think that's like something I personally have, taken away from this that it, that's potential that that could be the case that i have this like mm -hmm. romantic view of my mother because i do look at i look at her as like a fucking superhero man like she my it was my stepdad technically but he's my mm -hmm. dad he was always at work he was never home ever so my mom was kind of doing her best to be my mom and my dad so mm -hmm. i look at her as this like and she did considering that like a mother can only do so much of that she can only be so much of a mom and a dad i think she did such a damn good job that i think i like have built her up to be this superhero and maybe because of that i haven't really contended with some of the shortcomings in my childhood but yeah it's like it comes from a place of like fuck yeah mom you you did good considering the circumstances you know it's yeah no it, uncovering those things and contending with these moments is not to Again, shame the parent yeah. or like right. make them feel shitty or anything like that. Like, I also find it quite fucking hilarious that my mom gave me alcohol yeah. at the wedding. Yeah. Like, that is the most Paul family, <laughs> Meredith family, Buck's mom family thing quick, to do. It was effective. And it, that shit worked. <laughs> worked. And by the way, I love drinking. So, <laughs> yeah, she was a, an little, a little bit too much. So, right. but like, Right. But hey, that runs in the family. So it's like, I also can fucking laugh at these things. Mm -hmm. And that's the perspective, Jake. Yeah. like It's that it doesn't make it so big that it can't be talked about. It can't be looked at. Yeah. And what right do we have not to be able to honor the, the, the strengths and the struggles of the people we love? Doesn't that help us love them more instead of putting them up to in such a high honor that we can't? Do you know what happens when you look at someone as a superhero? They can never, ever fall down. Mm. They can never, ever be vulnerable. So in some ways, when you can look at your mom and say, wow, she did great here and not so great here, and I'm doing great and not so great there, you honor people with the ability to be able to keep learning and growing. That's what you do for them. So I was the golden child. I was supposed to take care of everything in the family. That's why I crashed and burned. That's why I crashed and burned because I wasn't given the, the right hmm. to, to not do something well. Everybody depended on me to do everything and do it well. That's not fair. Hmm. So I own my fuck ups. I'm proud of them. And I, and I, will, I will caveat that the parent brought the kid into the world and the right. kid didn't ask to be here <laughs> yes yeah, bro, and so dad. if you if you mm -hmm. parents mom dad are watching this think that you're gonna fucking judge me on my report card for six years <laughs> and give me fucking hell because i got a b minus or a c plus yep. that i'm not gonna come back and you now you have to look at me criticizing you and and analyzing you 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 fucked up, dog. That's right. You fucked up. My dad used to try to. This ain't a one way street, cuz. <laughs> he used to try to beef with me when I was young. He would be like, I fucking feed you. I put this roof over your head. Yeah. And I'm like, my dad did the same like, shit. I did. Yeah. Not asked to be here. Like, no I damn shit. Near, you don't did that. You fuck. He's like, you're ungrateful. I feed you. I brought you into this world. Like, like motherfucker, I couldn't have brought myself here. Fuck you. <laughs> the fuck out of wait, here, wait, I got dog. another one. How about the parents that go, oh, your mom? No, my daughter just got into Harvard. And you know what I say? Because you know I can be an asshole. Did you get into Harvard? Oh, no, 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 no. My daughter <laughs> did. I go, then why the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. She Man. did the work. Yeah, yeah, like, sure. It's not your, your moment. I'm sure. so proud of you. You know what that means? That means that some days you're not proud of me. And mm. is that my job? 
is to make you proud and to make you happy? Or is my job to figure out how to make myself uh, uh, principled and, and have a purpose? Hmm. So we have to be careful what we say. It's exactly what you said, Jake. I think we should have to go through classes. We should have to get a license to have kids. Like, think of all that the ass. shit you have to do. Right? You should have to be able to do that to know how to take a care of a kid. No, because then none of us would have been born. <laughs> That's true. That's that would true. be <laughs> fucked up. My dad, hell no. My, I would, my dad, or, what? No. <laughs> Two junkies trying to have a kid, bro? I would not be here. No shot. So, <laughs> I love that. Shout out to my pops now, though. Yeah. He's my homie. He's like my little brother now. You, you know how uh, important this moment is for me? Hmm. Can I just say that? I can't. I can't, could not have imagined years ago that I would be around such amazing young men um, and people who want to know and want to change this world. So as I'm going back into my final years, whatever that might be, I hope I live to be 100, and if I don't, okay, so be it. But I can't tell you how proud I am to be and honored I am to be here with you and to do this. You have been such a light in my life. I have learned so much from you, Jake. I want you Thank to know you. that. <laughs> these little fuckers too. I love <laughs> these little fuckers. We love you, Susie. We love you a lot. Thank you for changing my life and being an amazing light. And uh, yeah, it's it's been such an amazing journey. It's an honor. And working with you and hanging out with you and experiencing life. And those slippers. And these slippers. Yeah, can you show the viewers? <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. You start going to set therapy and then you start wearing yeah, I'm these right. slippers. Oh what does this have to do with therapy? Because you're being soft, man. Yeah, he's, you're tough off enough. he's tough enough to wear those now. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's got it's real true. toughness. Yeah, like I I dare someone put, say something about these to me. I, <laughs> there right. might be a gun in there, dog. Uh, under these stuffed animals. <laughs> I always say people are too soft to be gay. Mm. <laughs> There you go. Uh, like yeah. the people, people yeah. like guys. These like macho men are like, bro, fucking oh, gay, gay, bro. Yeah. You, you couldn't be gay. That's you, right. you, that you don't have the balls. You don't have the right. fucking right. balls, bro. Right. Your, your girlfriend when you walk up the stairs like sticks her finger up your butt and you go, ow, <laughs> don't do that. This, right. These fucking gay guys are taking eight inches in the ass. <laughs> And asking I was for nodding more. my head up until that point, man. And asking for more. Shout out, shout out to all the gay homies. Y'all are too fucking okay. soft to be gay. That's right. You're I, not I used to you couldn't take eight inches in your fucking butt. I had a gay brother. and This uh, is fucking and insane. He, my, my gay brother would have parties and I would say, so I have to go to a party tonight. And if I was dating someone or just met somebody, he goes, oh, well, can I come with you? And I go... No. Well, I said, yeah, but it's my gay brother's house. And all like this goes, oh, no, never mind. I go, don't worry. They won't find you attractive. No. <laughs> wait, but, wait, but. Wasn't that a yes. great a great line, right? Well, they, they won't find you attractive. What do you mean? Like, you know what? I've always and then they get offended. Like, yeah. yeah. People, yeah. people always say like, I don't mind if you're gay, just as long as you don't push it on me. Oh. I'm like, how many times has that really happened to you? Like, how many times have you walked into somebody and like all these gay guys just start harassing you? Like, Flocking to you. Doesn't like, happen. <laughs> chill out. Doesn't happen. It's the it's the macho men who are insecure uh, that always say some shit like that. I'm gonna ask my dad why he was a homophobe because bro, he raised me that way. And then I met some gay people growing up. I'm like, these is cool. The gay, gay people are the best. Cool. I have a bunch of gay friends. They're literally the best. They're the coolest bro. people ever. They're they're cooler than fucking everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they just live their lives unapologetically. Um, my friend here is boxing on December fifteenth. Bro, yeah, they wanted us to talk about uh. I'm just doing what I got to do to get paid. So just, <laughs> How's Kim going? How do you, how you feeling leading into this fight? I think the episode's over. Okay. Yep. okay. All right. Well, anyway, yeah, he's fighting on December 15th. they're not going to care. I don't know why they want me to keep on promoting this fucking he's the fight. fight. I don't he's care. He's fighting on December 15th against... I don't care. This is literally guy. just so I can get experience. Like, I'm wearing the same outfit as my last fight. Like, I'm just showing up and knocking this guy the fuck out. It has nothing to do. We don't need to promote this shit. But it's the road to what? It's the road to Becoming world Becoming a world champion. You can't... Just throw that he off. He is to the a side. world champion. He's just I'm already, not see, world. See, I'm you're giving free handouts, and yeah, we don't nah, do that. Nah, he ain't no you motherfucking not world, no champion. world champion. Yet. I am a world Until champion. He's, he's, he's not a world belt. champion. I am a world he's champion. He's not a world he's champion. champion. I'm not the world champion, but no, I he, am. He's dating a world, world champion. champion. He ain't shit yet. Yeah. Until he knocks out. Blurt this out. Badu Jack. You ain't what shit. No, I'm already I'm already world champion in my head, yeah, and I have to believe right. it Man, before cool. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell yeah. you you're not. You're a punk <laughs> bitch. I'm white in my head, but y'all tell me every day I'm not white. Right. 
So you ain't <laughs> shit until you do what you gotta do. <laughs> Love it. And that's become a world champion. Mm-hmm. That's like me saying I'm a platinum recording artist. In my head, I was damn, but I'm not. No, 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 no. That'd be like you saying I possess the capabilities. See, but you didn't and say talent. That. You didn't say that to you become said, a world champion. I know, or to be, to become a platinum recording. Artist. I know I do have those things, but yeah, but I don't need to elaborate on what I'm thinking. Yeah, because it doesn't translate but to the viewers. I'm not translating for the viewers. Say hey, fuck you, viewers. <laughs> no, literally, I said that earlier. <laughs> fuck you, viewers. No, I I am I I a world champion. Too. I don't need to elaborate the manifestation that's going on in my head. I possess the talent, the hard work, the skill set. All the attributes of a world champion. So I and he's going to showcase that on December fifteenth. I am that already, mm-hmm. and I'm willing and manifesting the rest into existence to become the world champion. There you and, go. I like that. And you know what? We deserve you too to be our world champion. I want you to know that. That was the most like therapist sounding. Thing you've said the whole episode. I know. That was it was so, pretty cool, huh? Yeah, but first, so you got to knock this name out. <laughs> yeah, which I will do. Subscribe. Bs Susie, thank you so much. Thanks, Susie. My honor. You're the best. Pleasure. You're We're all the, the best. best. Be your best. We love you guys. See you soon. Peace.